Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of Kuiper Labs. In today's video we're going to talk about UV visible spectrophotometry. We're going to start off by looking at what is spectrophotometry as a technique. We're then going to spend some time looking at the scientific ideas that underpin this technique. So concepts we call pi bonding, looking at um, electronic transitions within a molecule, so looking at a concept called conjugation, and focusing on transition metal complex ions as well. We're then going to look at actual instruments and look at the components of a spectrophotometer. We're going to look at the, the maximum absorbed wavelength called lambda max, and then compare spectrophotometry and colorimetry. So what is spectrophotometry? Essentially, we're talking about the use of the absorption of UV or visible electromagnetic radiation to help deduce or kind of understand more about molecular structure. So we're not trying to identify elements. We're trying to then understand more about the actual structure of a given molecule. So in order for it to be of any use, we have the substance that we're trying to test for has to either absorb UV or visible electromagnetic radiation. It makes sense that if we're trying to actually absorb, get, get it to absorb this, it has to do that. If it's transparent to these, these things, it won't be of any use. So um, organic compounds, we're talking about molecules that contain multiple carbon-carbon double bonds being particularly useful for this technique. And inorganic or kind of ionic compounds, we're talking about transition metal complex ions. So complex ions form from transition metals like copper or nickel or zinc, um, such as this um, complex ion with, that copper forms with a water molecule. So now we're going to unpack some of the science underneath how this works, um, particularly focusing on organic chemistry for the moment. And so we're going to talk about now what we, a concept we call pi bonding, or that is bringing our understanding of the quantum model of the atom um, and actually kind of understanding how that helps us to understand bonding in a molecule rather than just focusing on a given atom. So we talk about S, P, D and F orbitals and we're focusing on the fact that um, we have S orbitals are, that are involved in actually making a single connection between those carbon atoms in the middle here, this, this black line that's represented. But that in order to actually make a, that second bond, we have to involve some of the P electrons that are involved that then we get this overlap form from these p orbitals here and here. So they're all part of the same kind of orbitals because it's kind of top and bottom. And then so we get some overlap that takes place. And what you see here is that the red bit in this diagram represents where those, uh, those electrons can be found. Okay, because we form this carbon-carbon double bond, the second bond, by overlapping these p orbitals. Which means then that these electrons in this second bond, where you see the red here rather than the grey in the middle, are more accessible. They're more reactive. That's why one reason why double bonds are chemically very reactive. But it also means that these electrons are more susceptible to electromagnetic radiation in terms of absorption and emission. So now what we see is, all right, based on kind of this scientific idea, we see that um, electrons can absorb energy to go from a ground state to an excited state. That's kind of the Bohr model in a nutshell. Um, but what we see is that now if we've kind of got to blend our understanding of the quantum model with how molecules are put together with the fact that now electrons can still do these jumps. And so what we do is now instead of considering them in terms of kind of like ground state and excited state, just kind of, you know, the first shell, second shell, third shell, is we say, all right, well, we've got these different energy states that are based on where these electrons are involved. Are they in bonds? Are they in the single bond or a double bond? Or are they in a lone pair? of electrons. And then what we see is that these electrons can go, um, can absorb electromagnetic radiation to make a jump in energy level within the molecule. And so we say, all right, well, maybe the electron is at this sigma, which is the single bond in the middle. Maybe it's involved in the double bond. Maybe it's a lone pair, a non-bonding electron pair. But what happens is that th these up here, these orbitals, they're called molecular orbitals, are kind of the unoccupied high energy orbitals or places where these electrons can be in terms of energy. And so these electrons that from one of these green levels can jump up to one of the red levels. We denote them with this little kind of star symbol to show that it's a high energy unstable energy level. And so a different amount of energy is needed to actually make these jumps depending on how big the, the jump is. So the jump from a sigma bonding um, orbital to a pi star antibonding one here is a massive arrow, whereas from a non-bonding up to a sigma star here is a small arrow representing a small energy change. Okay, but so the idea is that electrons absorb 
specific amounts of energy to make certain jumps to high energy unstable states. But the thing is that not all of these, um, uh, these transitions are going to be possible in a given molecule. That only some, uh, only really kind of two ones in particular are, that are going to be happening. And that is going from the pi bonding to pi antibonding, so from here to here, and the one from N non-bonding up to the same level. So just if we single these out, we see them here. Because the, the reason for this is that these electron transitions require um, electromagnetic radiation that that may be beyond what the visible um, or UV part of the spectrum can provide. Maybe they need X-rays to actually respond or gamma rays or something like that. But so if we're trying to focus on just this light that we can use for this technique, that only certain transitions are going to be of any use. And so these ones that are involved in double bonds or ones that are involved in lone pairs are the only ones that are going to respond. Okay, but what that means is that those things, knowing that they will respond, can be very useful for us. But particularly the reason that they become useful is this concept we call conjugation. That lots of molecules that, that occur that have double bonds in them don't just have one, but actually that they have multiple double bonds um, that are kind of in this alternating pattern. So if you notice this one here, this is buta-1,3-diene, um, you see we've got a double, single, double. Um, here, this is called benzene. We have double, single, double, single, double, single, kind of going around in this hexagon shape. What that means is that, that, that we say that these double bonds are conjugated, that they've kind of separated with only a single gap in between. They're alternating. What that means, if we look at this, you see this red area here, and then in the benzene we see it here, is that these electrons in the double bonds actually start to smoosh across the whole molecule. They become delocalized. That is, they're not just attached to one particular bond anymore, but they actually kind of ex can be found at any point along the whole molecule. So what that means now is that now there, there's a much larger place that, that these electrons can be found or kind of what it, and you know that they're distributed across this whole big area. And so if we look at ethene compared with buta-1,3-diene, what happens is that now the more delocalized these electrons are, the easier it is to bridge the gap. So the arrow, the size of the arrow, which is admittedly not to scale, but you see the size of the arrow represents the same type of jump, but it's easier in buta-1,3-diene than in ethene. We've, we've lower energy electromagnetic radiation is what we need to absorb, which means then that especially if we start having more and more conjugated double bonds, that now it actually brings it into the area of the spectrum, which is the visible region, which actually is what is responsible for giving compounds their colour. So beta carotene, for example, is the orange pigment that gives carrots their colour. And it has 11 conjugated double bonds within this big long structure. That actually, that having this many delocalized electrons lowers that energy gap so much that, that, that low energy visible light is enough to make the jump. And we can actually detect this as colour. Now, the areas of the molecule that respond in this way, that actually interact with visible light like this, we call them chromophores. That is, that they kind of seek out colour or respond to colour. Now, no, not just organic compounds will do this, but actually complex ions with transition metals can be used in this way. So think about inorganic things. So for example, in copper, that our outer shell of electrons, we've got five d orbitals. Four of them are completely filled, and the fifth one only has one electron in it. But what happens, as we start to get these water molecules pulling in closer or kind of interacting with the copper, that we actually end up with this splitting effect that three of the orbitals become low energy ones down the bottom and then the other two become high energy orbitals up here separated by this energy gap. And what mean, that means is that with this, something like copper where we've got a little space here that one of these electrons can actually be promoted up provided that this amount of energy is absorbed to make that happen. And that then corresponds to a particular colour of light which is actually going to hit that to make it jump up. And so that's partly why transition metal complexes or transition metals tend to be coloured in solution, whereas other ions tend not to be. Um, you know, sodium isn't coloured, but you know, copper is, and nickel and cobalt and things, they form intense colours um, because of this ability to actually promote electrons based on absorbing this energy. Okay, so absorbing this visible electromagnetic radiation promotes that electron to a, uh, an empty spot um, in the upper d orbitals. 
So that's kind of, I know that was a lot of detail there in terms of the science behind how spectrophotometry works, but it's essentially this idea that absorbing these UV or visible wavelengths to cause electrons in molecules and in complex ions to get promoted to high levels. So the components of a spectrophotometer are highly similar to that of a colorimeter. But the difference in the monochromator here is particularly important to be able to select for um, an accurate, um, you know, specific wavelength. Because one of the ideas about spectrophotometry is that um, if, you know, we, we see it produces a spectrum like this, that we actually plot the absorbance um, at various wavelengths in turn. And the monochromator allows us to actually select for these given wavelengths. So it's kind of a much more um, specific and selective technique. But it's important that we can actually pick wavelengths that are going to give us the most absorption. So if we look at this particular substance, that we can see that we get a peak at 217 nanometers, which is well into the UV area of the spectrum, because 400 is kind of the, the, the limits of the visible spectrum. Um, and so we're in the UV and we identify that 217 nanometers is going to give us a maximum absorption. Okay, and so the wavelength, the lambda max that, that we see is where we get the maximum light absorbed combined with minimal interference from other substances. So this idea, if we come back to here, is that this may not be the wavelength that we pick to test this substance, because maybe there's other things in that sample that also absorb this wavelength or something near it. Maybe we need to pick something else as a second chance option. So now what we're just going to have a quick look at comparing spectrophotometry versus colorimetry. Okay, spectrophotometry, we're actually measuring a range of possible wavelengths, where this colorimetry, we're focusing on a specific wavelength at a time. Okay, for spectrophotometry, we're measuring the absorbance at all of these wavelengths and actually then creating that spectrum that you saw just in this previous graph. Whereas we're getting absorbance at a single wavelength only for colorimetry. We get a spectrum with spectrophotometry, but we only get a numerical value of absorbance with colorimetry. However, what colorimetry, colorimetry can do is give us quantitative information when we combine it with the, the construction of a calibration line, whereas the spectrum is qualitative. But what it does is allow us to do is it allows us to target a specific wavelength that then we can actually kind of focus that maybe we want to get quantitative data by now pinpointing the, the wavelength that we want. So we looked at the, the concept behind spectrophotometry. We looked at some of the, the underlying scientific ideas of pi bonding. That is the, the electrons used to make double bonds in a structure. We looked at conjugation um, and transition metal complex ions and seeing the different possible transitions or jumps that an electron can make in a molecule and seeing how that correlates to the amount of energy it would absorb um, to actually make that jump. We looked at the components of a spectrophotometer and seeing kind of how the instrument is put together. We looked at the concept of lambda max, the way we get maximum absorbance, and we compared spectrophotometry and colorimetry. Thanks very much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Bye for now.